Hello, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Rose Jackson, and I'm the director of the Democracy and Tech Initiative at the Atlantic, Atlantic Council's Digital Forensic Research Lab. We're one of the earliest centers dedicated to studying, reporting on, and advancing solutions for disinformation, democratic information spaces, and the challenges posed to open societies by technology. I'm delighted today to welcome you all for this exciting book launch with the authors of System Error, where big tech went wrong and how we can reboot. When my former colleague Jeremy told me that he and his colleagues, uh, Marin Sahami and Rob Reich were writing a book based on their experience building a new kind of interdisciplinary curriculum for computer science at Stanford, I told him he would have no choice but to show up here at some point and do an event. So I'm thrilled to see this book in the world and delighted to have its creators with us today. At the initiative I run here at the Atlantic Council, we often say we're focused on the ways that tech is funded, built, and governed, and how that impacts the long-term viability of human rights and democracy in the world. And I think while the policy world is increasingly digging into the governance part of that equation, it often feels like we're missing the other two components. So what I find most compelling and important about the book we'll be discussing today is its focus on not only how the discipline of engineering has emphasized optimization as its guiding star and the consequences that derive from that, but also how that singular focus on optimization and scale has driven the funding decisions that determine what problems deserve to be solved in the world by who and how. So to guide us in this conversation, we're very lucky to be joined today by Nanjala Nyabola, who in addition to being a non-resident senior fellow with us here at the DFR lab, is one of the leading African scholars focused on the intersection of technology, media, and society. She's the author of two of her own excellent books that I encourage you to check out. And I should note that she was kind enough to join us today from her home in Nairobi, where I believe it's about 9 p.m. So before I pass this on to Ninjala, I want to go through a few very quick housekeeping items. Uh, if you wish to view today's program with closed captioning, it's available on YouTube at the link that is about to be provided in your chat. If you have any questions during the conversation and throughout it, please send them via the Q&A option on your screen and they'll be addressed in the last 15 minutes or so of the conversation. So without further ado, I'm delighted to welcome Ninjala to our virtual stage. Thank all of you for joining us and thank you to the authors for uh, joining us for what I'm hopeful is going to be a fascinating conversation. Ninjala? Thank you, Rose. I'm very excited to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, as Rose said, we are joined today by uh, the three writers of this new book, System Era, where big tech went wrong and how we can reboot for a very informal conversation about the book and about sort of the themes and the ideas that the book is trying to um, advance. By way of introduction, I just want to um, you know, uh, introduce you to the people that we're speaking to today. Uh, first of all, we're joined by Rob Reich. Uh, Rob is a renowned philosopher based at Stanford. He's the director of the Stanford Center for Ethics in Society and the co-director of the Center on Philanthropy and Civil Society, as well as the associate director of Stanford's new Institute for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. We're also joined by Mehran Sahami, who is the Associate Chair for Education in Stanford's Computer Science Department, where he helped redesign the program's undergraduate curriculum. Mehran started his career as an engineer, in, as an engineer notab notably contributing to the invention of email spam filtering technology while at Google. So, you know, thank Mehran. Um, <laughs> and uh, he returned to Stanford as a computer science professor in 2007 and now holds the James and Elena Cheesebrook Professorship in Engineering. Finally, we're joined by uh, Jeremy Weinstein, who served under President Obama as the and later as the Chief of Staff and finally Deputy to then U.S. Ambassador to the U.S. to the U.N. Samantha Power. Um, Jeremy, from his from this position, Jeremy foresaw that new technologies might remake the relationship between governments and citizens citizens, which led him to launch Ob President Obama's Open Government Partnership, amongst other initiatives. Um, he's now a professor of political science at Stanford, where he leads Stanford's Impact Labs. Thank you so much um, for joining us today, gentlemen, for what I hope is going to be a very interesting conversation. Um, it was an interesting book. I, uh, I enjoyed reading it. And I just have some questions that, you know, we'll start off with, a, with some softball questions. Um, who was the audience that you had in mind when you were writing this book? If I could start with you, Rob. Uh, 
Sure. Well, uh, thanks so much for the invitation to join you all today. Uh, as, as was mentioned in, in the introduction, we started this collaboration amongst the three of us without an eye toward writing a book, but rather with an eye toward teaching a class for Stanford undergraduates. And the idea behind that was that the, the bloom was coming off the rose of Silicon Valley, the extraordinary power of acquiring technical skills and then bringing them to the market and then into big tech companies in particular to power the digital revolution was not only producing extraordinary benefits for people, but also producing some obvious and increasing harms that were becoming more widely visible to every member of society. So we thought fusing or integrating an ethical perspective, I as a philosopher brought that, a policy and social science perspective, Jeremy was the one bringing that, and a technical perspective from Meron in the computer science department was an important way of, of educating the next generation of technologists, so many of whom come out of Stanford University. And importantly, not only technologists, but people who had policy aspirations or wanted to work in civil society organizations to ensure that they took on board some of these extraordinary technical skills and also had a more um, fine-grained fine understanding about what it means to be a technologist. So we successfully launched this class three years ago. We immediately had enrollment of several hundred students. We brought the class then next to Silicon Valley and, and taught people who work in the tech industry and found a, a really enthusiastic reception there. And once we felt like there was a growing appetite for some of the material we put together, we thought to ourselves, you know, we'd, we'd love to try to communicate some of the ideas uh, to a general audience. And, and we had in mind something like, you know, um, our respective aunts or uncles or parents, people who use all of the digital tools and products like almost all the rest of us but who really don't understand much about the orientation of a technologist or the mindset of a Silicon Valley founder, or for that matter, um, anything much about how the technology works. So we wanted to try to illustrate for a general reader um, how it is that the mess we've gotten ourselves into where big tech went wrong could be made understandable to a general audience so that all of us would have a voice and a way of exercising our agency in channeling um, a collective response and shaping the technological future we want together, rather than leaving it to the founders and the engineers alone inside the companies. So Mehran, you've been in big tech. Um, you've kind of, you know how the sausage is made. Um, the book's sub, you know, subheading is where big tech went wrong. Um, from your perspective, if you had to diagnose the problem, where did big tech go wrong? Like, what is the issue that your book is trying to speak to? One of the main themes that comes out early on in the book is something we refer to as the optimization mindset, which is this notion of engineers wanting to optimize particular metrics. When we think about the training in computer science or engineering more broadly, that's generally there's this orientation toward efficiency and toward optimization. You know, how do we solve problems as quickly as possible or as efficiently as possible? And that generates a particular mindset that pretty much spills over into other aspects of life. But what it oftentimes means in the context of big tech in the business world is that there are particular measures that are used as proxies for sort of the, the higher level messages or themes that someone would want to get across. So as a particular example, you could consider something like Facebook says they want to connect the world. Well, what does it mean to connect the world? If you want to think about having some way of measuring that so you can optimize it and increase it and be able to track it, you end up doing things like measuring the amount of time people spend on a platform or the amount of content they engage with, the number of likes, the kinds of things they click through on. And of course, you measure revenue and is generated by, for example, clicking on ads. And so when you have these kinds of metrics, but you now take them to scale, because there's this relentless push to be able to scale these technologies to a planetary scale, what ends up happening is that your original idea to connect the world is now diverging more and more from these particular metrics that you're trying to optimize. Because just because you're creating more connections or you're having people click on more content doesn't necessarily mean they feel any closer to each other especially if they're clicking on content, for example, that's polarizing or is misinformation or causes them to become angry or agitated. So what we find is part of the problem is that 
this relentless push toward optimization and trying to push these metrics even further gets a greater divergence at scale from the societal outcomes we'd like to actually see or the messages that companies often send about what they're trying to achieve. And in the long term, when we have lots of companies trying to do this and optimizing for the particular metrics that they choose, right, there's no democratic process in choosing what gets optimized. It's basically a group of executives and engineers in those companies that make those choices. Those choices then get reflected at societal scale when we think about billions of people using these platforms. Mm. And you've set up my next question really well, Jeremy, which is for you. And of course, you've worked in global policy. Um, the word we is used a lot in this book, but who is the we that you have in mind um, when using it in the book? Who is we? A great question, Anjala. And, and obviously, uh, you know, one of the real challenges with respect to big tech is that uh, power is concentrated in the hands of an incredibly small number of people inside companies. Uh, the CEOs that, that, that sort of lead companies, the investors that invest in these companies. And that determines a lot about what problems are solved with technology and also how the potential harms of technology are weighed and, and evaluated. And, and the impetus behind the book is to suggest that our technological future is something that shouldn't be left entirely in the hands of the technologists or entirely in the hands of the experts. That ultimately, as you said, we all have a role to play. But how we play that role uh, is, is really going to be dependent on, uh, you know, many of the structures that govern, the, you know, the potential inputs that we can provide to this conversation. And so we think about different kinds of actors in this ecosystem. Part of the argument is that if you are yourself a technologist, that is, you're in the business of building technologies or scaling those technologies to markets, it's imperative that you recognize the ways in which the technologies that you build are not value neutral, that they actually embed choices, ways of refereeing value trade-offs, and then impose those values on others. And so a whole part of the conversation is for people who see themselves in the tech ecosystem, whether they're an investor in a company or a product manager in a company or a technologist and a coder, to think about what an ethic of responsibility that pays attention to harms that might go well beyond the individual user's experience of a technology. So that's part of the we. But part of the we is also all of us who are consumers of technologies in this space, which is recognizing that there is power in our choices, but also the choices that have been framed for us as binary choices, which is accept Facebook as it is with its benefits and harms or go off the grid, accept Zoom as it is with its privacy policies or don't engage via video conferencing technology. That we have a voice as consumers and users of products vis-a-vis -vis the companies themselves, but also vis-a-vis -vis, uh, our ability to pick and choose among potential companies to signal what our preferences are. And then the final element of we, Nanjala, is, is the question of politics and, and regulation and where ultimately the choices that are made that build guardrails around technology that regulate the tech ecosystem are choices that are going to be made via political processes. And when we think about political processes, those tend to be delimited by the boundaries of nation states, even though the effects of technology are not at all delimited by the boundaries of nation states. And that means they're gonna be important locuses of regulatory momentum, locuses of momentum like we see in the European Union, a locus of momentum that's emerging in the policy window that we have in Washington. And one of our central challenges as we think about these areas and arenas where regulation will happen is how do we make sure that those conversations are not informed only by the interests of that narrow polity, right? That is the United States and its relationship with technology, but that also take into account the harms that are experienced by people, uh, you know, all around the world as a result of products that are produced, generated, or governed in the United States. I'm going to push you a little bit on that, Jeremy, because that's something that definitely um, jumped out to me as a reader and um, is part of the we question and my perspective as well, because um, I think it's one of the things that, you know, working in outside the United States, working on technology and politics outside the United States um, really struck me that, you know, the underlying idea that these are problems that will be solved in the United States. Um, why 
if you, you know, what, what was the thinking um, behind that? I think you've alluded it to a little bit, but, you know, the, the, what is the thinking behind, you know, we saw with the shutdown, um, with the recent Facebook shutdown, you know, Facebook has 3 billion users around the world, um, 2 billion WhatsApp users. So when, you know, Facebook goes down, it's not just an Amer American problem, it's also a problem in India, and it's also a problem in uh, Kenya, it's a problem in South Africa, it's a problem everywhere. We saw, um, you know, the, the Twitter ban in Nigeria, Twitter is still banned in Nigeria right now because of a policy decision that stemmed directly from the idea of put taking uh, former President Trump of the of the platform so i want to push you a little bit on this idea of um the locuses of of solutions or the locuses of resolution because i i as a reader i felt you know the focus in washington do you not don't you think that that's a little bit um constraining for you know thinking about where solutions might come from well so let me say a couple things and you know nanjala i also welcome your thoughts about alternative arenas in which you'd like to see these conversations happen. But I guess I'd say a couple of things. Number one, the book is very clear that actually most regulatory momentum on, on big tech has not come from Washington up until the current moment. In fact, it's been led out of the European Union uh, and that's been extraordinarily important in changing the game with respect to big tech's relationship with its users. And of course, part of the power of, of a set of political institutions aligned in the way that European states are under the European Union is the ability to impact the incentives for big tech companies, even if they're not headquartered in the European Union. Um, and so that's been an important arena in which these conversations have been happening. Why is there so much focus on Washington in the book? Well, well, for two reasons. Number one, part of the part of the the situation in which we find ourselves is one in which the deliberate decisions out of Washington to craft a regulatory oasis around big tech have enabled many of the bad behaviors and the social consequences that we see now. And we need to take ownership of that. We need to take ownership that, that the permissive environment around access to people's personal data was an explicit policy choice, right, of the American regulatory regime that oversees the big tech space, likewise with respect to legal immunity for platforms. And so our politics and the way in which American politics has created the space for big tech has enabled a set of the problems that we see. And thus, it's essential that the United States get into the game with respect to, to organizing and developing a set of guardrails to address these harms. Now, where we probably agree, although we could debate what the right forum is, is just getting the U.S. into the game isn't enough because who has a voice in the U.S. political debates about regulation, right? There isn't enough space in that conversation ultimately to, 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 to create agency and voice for those all around the world who are affected uh, by technology products that are designed in the United States or built by companies that are headquartered in the United States. And so partly we need our regulatory process to take into account harms that go well beyond the boundaries of any given country. But also we're gonna to need to create international mechanisms that enable uh, you know, conversation and dialogue around what the right regulatory frameworks are. And of course, the US needs to be willing to be at the table and it's only in the last year or two that we finally have an openness to these conversations. So I'd say we are at the very beginning of figuring out what is the right forum and construct. Um, but, but the US has to come to the table with a set of views and a set of ideas so that they can be you know, rejected, embraced, engaged by others. I'm going to uh, put it to you um, that you know part of the things that brought the US to the table is the fact that a lot of the issues that had been brewing in other parts of the world that people had been encountering in other parts of the world finally came home to roost. And a lot of the alarms that had been ringing in countries like India, like Kenya, like Brazil were finally a reality in the United States and forcing that decision. Um, but I want to turn to you, uh, Rob, because you're an ethicist, you're a philosopher, and there's three levels of ethics that are woven through this book. There is uh, professional ethics, there is legal ethics, there is moral ethics, you know, like the, the classical philosophical, uh, you know, moral um, uh, ethicists, et ethics. So from your perspective, given the urgency of the situation that is upon us right now, what should we be paying attention to? Um, you you touch on a multiple of a number of them in the book, but what should we be paying attention to? You know, within the next uh, six months, eight months, one year. Great, 
Terrific. Yeah. So I think, especially, you know, lodged as I am at a university campus, one of the suspicions is that, well, if we just ensure that all of the engineering students get an ethics course and, and ensure that they go into the profession with a, a moral compass, um, then things will get better. And we emphatically, I emphatically want to reject that idea as a solution. Um, you know, the, the poster person at the moment for uh, a moral compass gone bad is a Stanford dropout named Elizabeth Holmes, who was the founder of Theranos. And um, I think it's just, you know, defies belief that if only she had gotten an ethics course as a 19 year old at Stanford, she wouldn't have allegedly lied, cheated and deceived her investors, her employees and the public. So. Of course, personal ethics is a, a welcome thing to have, but that is not the fundamental issue because human beings are flawed. None of us is a complete saint. We will always underperform relative to our moral standards if we have them, but we should still strive. Okay, fine. So where are the more interesting moral or ethical questions? We point to two different arenas, and this is where we think the most essential kind of collective thinking needs to be done. So the first is what you described in the first, uh, the first of the uh, second of the three levels. There's personal ethics, personal compass, but then the second is professional ethics. So this is where to put some in investment of time. Um, in many other professional domains, the obvious ones here are medicine or, or the law, but in so many different professions, there are a set of professional norms that collectively guide and orient the responsible practice of that profession. And if you're a, a lawyer, sometimes these are backed by actual legal sanctions that you know put teeth into an enforcement mechanism of what just professional behavior can, is. Mm -hmm. In medicine, you, you can't just start to do experiments with novel drug treatments on human beings. You have to go through um, a variety of different uh, permissions and trials, and then you have to get in different places a federal administration to approve a drug once it's been tested. Um, there's the Hippocratic Oath. There's an entire scholarly field called biomedical ethics. Hospital committees, uh, hospitals often have ethics committees. There's a big institutional footprint in many places around professional ethics, but not in computer science, not in artificial intelligence. Um, we don't yet have the kind of professional and institutional maturity that has come along with older professions like medical practice or the law. Computer science only came into being as a discipline in the 1950s and 60s. And we're just now, we think at the moment where we can put a lot of energy into forming um, a much stickier sense of professional norms and ethics within AI, within computer science. And there's a whole bunch of ideas in the book generated in that direction. Finally, the third level of ethics, I think you called it, Nanjala, legal ethics, and, and that's a fine way to describe it. For, um, um, in, in the book, we use the term social or political ethics. But the idea here is that um, outside of the realm of professional ethics and far beyond the realm of personal ethics is the idea that in any society, there's going to be a competition and diversity of interests and a diversity of values. And what makes democracy such an important form of social organization is that it aspirationally tries to create a fair process for refereeing and, and um, giving everyone a voice in what our social choices are at scale within our social and political institutions. That's a lot of democracy theory speak. Let me make it much more, much, much more straightforward here for a second. Um, the hardest questions about the relationship between technology and society are not questions of right and wrong, true or false, but questions that only register in the form of better and worse answers. And if we ask ourselves questions like, how should we balance the value of privacy against the value of personal safety or national security? So that when we have end-to-end -end encrypted messaging systems like WhatsApp that are used across the world, as you said, by nearly 2 billion people, well, end-to-end -end encryption puts a heavy thumb on the scale of individual privacy. Neither the government, any government, nor a company can inspect the content of the messages. But if you try to coordinate committing a crime or child pornography or any other sort of criminal activity via end-to-end -end encrypted messages, there's little chance for anyone to balance privacy concerns against personal safety or national security. In, in our book, we try to present the value trade-offs that are encoded into the technological products we use 
where all of the decisions are being made by a small number of people in the companies imposed then on the rest of us. We had the, the founder of one of the most popular end-to-end -end encrypted messaging apps come into our classroom and explained how the thing worked and how important it was that people across the world had privacy. And when someone asked the question, well, what about in concerns of national security, where there might be a legitimate concern from someone in, in a government to try to um, intercept or interrupt some type of, of you know, possibly terrorist activity. And the response he offered by looking at it, the students was that, does anyone in the room really care about democracy anymore? Is this a thing for, for, for you still? And that for us kind of encapsulates the problem of social and political ethics. Right now, when products achieve extraordinary scale, what we get are the values encoded into the products by the small number of people who built them, rather than the age old technology of democracy at work to allow all people a voice and then referee these value trade-offs socially rather than giving all of the agency and all of the power to the technologists. So in that regard, how would you distinguish between professional ethics? I think you alluded in the book, uh, the idea of a uh, standard setting body, kind of like what you talked about with medicine, with That's other right. fields, there's like the professional ethics board. How would you distinguish between uh, professional ethics and this notion of self-regulation, which we're increasingly aware it's it's not cutting it. You know, the idea that these companies will self-regulate is not cutting it. What would be the distinction between those two? That's right. So you're exactly correct that that um, um, professional ethics or professional norms are a form of self-regulation, um, and we think they're a necessary but not sufficient condition here. They're they're not going to solve all the problems that we 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 need to solve at a social level as well through ordinary forms of regulation and through the introduction of alternative mechanisms for governing um, our our uh, our technologies, and so. Uh, uh, you know what we have in mind. I mean, try this on as a as a, as an idea. Um, one of the other most important technological frontiers today across the world is bioengineering, and in particular, this this new technique of engineering the um, the genes of living beings called CRISPR. And um, this new book by Walter Isaacson about the co-discoverer of CRISPR, a person who um, teaches just up the road from us in San Francisco, Jennifer Doudna, um, it recounts the story of how shortly after making this discovery and realizing then the extraordinary power of what it could mean if people across the world could now edit the, the very genetic structure of, of not merely um, plants or animals, but also humans, she tried to organize a professional ban or moratorium on using this gene editing technique on human beings. It wasn't um, an international legal body that did it. It wasn't a domestic um, um, political order that did it. It was a professional social norm that um, made it inadvisable. And when a single scientist did in fact use CRISPR on a, on a human, um, a, a Chinese biomedical scientist uh, did this a few years ago, he was immediately ostracized from the community of respectable science. No journal would publish his articles. Uh, no professional conference would allow him to come speak. Eventually, to the best of my understanding, he was actually imprisoned in, in, in China as well. And I ask anyone in the audience who's listening, thinking now about artificial intelligence, can you think of a single AI scientist who used some type of artificial intelligence tool or technology um, in such a way that got them excommunicated from the respectable practice of AI. Um, we see these examples in other professions, but not yet in AI. And I wanna agree with you 100%, Nanjula, that this is not uh, enough to create the kind of guardrails that we need more broadly through ordinary actions of governments but it is a necessary step in order to introduce an ethic of responsibility within the very pipeline of development. And I'll just conclude by saying, why would I think that that's necessary? It's because we think there's a kind of constant and longstanding race between scientific and technological innovation that races ahead of public policy and democratic governance. Um, the, the, the wonders of the marketplace that have private investment and private initiative that bring innovations um, to, the, to the market and to people, 
helps to produce a dynamic society which has extraordinary benefits in many ways. And that means that in certain respects, governments will always be a lagging behind a little bit, especially as the development of technology has accelerated. So we also need this ethic of responsibility, a set of professional norms within the mindset of the engineer as well, in order to avoid some of the worst outcomes. Um, I'm gonna, <laughs> let me look back to that. I'm gonna jump to Mehran. Uh, um, is big tech infrastructure? Mehran, this is for you. It is big tech infrastructure? I'm not sure I got the whole question. Is it public infrastructure? Um, the reason I'm asking is obviously the rules that govern infrastructure, public infrastructure, are different from the rules that govern private corporations. And I feel like this is maybe the, the fork in the road that we've we've uh, reached. Uh, this was some of the debate actually that came out of the Facebook shutdown that, um, you know, the you saw all of the uh, polemic WhatsApp in many places, WhatsApp is the internet. It's how people know. And when people were messaging to say WhatsApp is down, they didn't say WhatsApp is down. They said the internet um, is down. And so have we gotten to the point where we have to think about big tech as infrastructure? Because the way we regulate water the way we regulate electricity utilities is different from the way that we regulate, um, say, food production, you know, even though, you know, obviously many questions around that, but the way we think about food production, the way, you know, we think about um, commercial products, it's very different from the way we think about public infrastructure. So are we at the point where we should start to think about, and, you know, Ethan Zuckerman has written extensively about this, big tech as part of our internet infrastructure, public infrastructure? Right, that's a great question. And thanks for the clarification, because as a technologist, when I hear infrastructure, I think of a very different notion of infrastructure. <laughs> um, and you know, I think a great example of that in the past was AT&T, the phone company, which was treated as essentially a utility and heavily regulated by the government in terms of what they could do, um, how they could, the amount of profit they could generate, the amount of investment that as a result they put back into the company. And there were actually some real benefits of that at the time. There was a lot of research actually that came out of AT&T that laid the foundation for what we think of now as the modern information age, including the notion of information theory as a theoretical con construction came out of that you know, public but heavily regulated company. In terms of the arguments of whether or not we're at the same place now to think about the companies for the internet, I think the question is, you know, what are the compelling factors that make us think of this as a public utility as opposed to a space where there's still competition? So if we think about the story of how things played out with AT&T, as a matter of national security, among other things, as a communications platform, that's why we got some of the heavy regulation of AT&T that we did. But ultimately, we saw deregulation of that space. We got greater competition. Um, and one can argue what was the result of that greater competition. Did we actually get more options as consumers? Did we get lower prices? Um, that's something that economists still debate. When we think about the internet and what it means in terms of uh, controlling the communications that happen, we need to think very carefully about what is the control that we want to have on the internet as a public utility. Is the government in a place to actually be able to control the pipes of the internet in some sense to, for example, to guarantee a particular level of service? Um, when we actually see the level of private investment that's made in these companies, um, I'm a little weary of the fact of thinking the government would make the same level of investment and attract the same expertise to be able to uh, provide the kind of uh, level of service guarantees that we would want to have in the internet. So we're left with the question of, well, what's the flip side? What are the alternatives and what does that mean for us? And I think the alternative is if we still think of it as a private space, how do we get more of the kinds of outcomes we would like to see? And Rob alluded to the notion of thinking of uh, political ethics, right? That how can we bring a collective decision making, at least in democracies, to bear on that on that process? That's where regulation comes in. So I think it's still possible for these companies to be thought of as private companies, but with guardrails in place 
to get more of the outcomes we actually want. But the level of investment that's been necessary to create this uh, growth of the internet, I think really we wouldn't have seen the same kind of investment if we treated them as public utilities. And you can see that a little bit in the history of the internet. If you look at the early days of the plumbing of the internet, a lot of it was funded by government investment. It was very heavily regulated with respect to not having commercial activity on it. And we saw in the mid 1990s, that's why we got the blossoming of a lot of these companies at that time, also with the advent of the World Wide Web, that there was this movement toward wanting to see greater investment. And at that time, there was actually specific policies to, to create a regulatory oasis around big tech to give them the opportunity to grow unfettered. Um, like we're getting to a moment now where we're thinking, do we need to put those, you know, do, do we need to have some more fettering sort of in place? And I think the, the evidence makes sure that it makes it clear that we do. But I think that comes in, you know, thinking about sensible policies around things like privacy, which we've already seen the EU take a lead on, but we need to see the United States do more there. We need to think about having more accountability and transparency and due process with algorithmic decision making. So I think there's lots of ways to think about regulation and we can get into more of those details to the extent that there is interest without going all the way to the level of thinking of these companies as utilities that are that are regulated that way by the government. Um, if I may push you a little bit on that, um, because one of the things that's woven into the book, of course, the parallel theme, one theme being technology, the other theme being democracy. And ultimately, democracy is about values. It's about beliefs. It's about, um, uh, you know, coming together to build a kind of society that we think reflects um, the kind of people we are, the kind of people we aspire to be. Um, without this consciousness that big tech has public responsibilities, which flows logically from the idea that they are public utilities, not necessarily in the way that we think about water and electricity, but that they do have some public obligations. How do we create a world? In, so without that belief, how do we create a world in which the values aspect of big tech is not left to, uh, and I think Jeremy alluded to this, is not left to the decision-making of the people who build these companies? How do we get to a place whereby there is more guiding the values conversation within these big tech companies than just a tagline, do no harm, uh, mm -hmm. connecting the world? Don't be evil. Yeah, it's a fantastic point. Yeah. Can I, How do we get there? Yeah, I, go ahead. Rob. I want to jump in on this, Rob, then, then you can go. Because <laughs> okay. Not, not all, I, lo I, love, I love where your questions are coming from uh, and, and, and they're pushing in exactly the right ways. Um, so, you know, as we've thought about this problem, we really believe it needs to be tackled from multiple angles. So one angle is absolutely the work of cultivating this ethic among technologists themselves. And we describe the immaturity of this field in contrast to lots of other fields, because we do believe it's possible to create a sense of professional ethics and a sense of norms that are owned by social communities that, that begin to reflect values that we might share collectively. Um, and so that, that is a feature of how we've transformed medicine and the life sciences over the last 100, 125 years from something that did tremendous harm to something that's been, you know, been a tool for generating greater life expectancy and bringing down maternal mortality and child mortality. We professionalized that space. Uh, and brought in principles of do no harm and principles of ethical obligation. Um, so I think that is possible and we're just at the early period of that. The second is that th there's nothing fixed about the companies themselves. And part of Maron's answer to you, uh, you know, challenging the public utility model is to say, we need to be in a world in which there's far greater competition in the sector around important products that we use Part of that will be driven by antitrust enforcement, but part of that will also be driven by technologists and employees voting with their feet, using their voice, right? To shape and, and diversifying what that pipeline is into tech itself, something that we've made a major priority at Stanford because who's in the room shapes what problems are solved, what questions are being asked, what social harms are being thought about. And so you are gonna need some remaking of the tech sector and that is already happening. The, the worker mobilization that we see, the, the walkouts related to partnering with the US national security infrastructure, 
the rejection of non-disclosure agreements and the Me Too movement, the concerns about bias in, in image recognition software and the like. We see that mobilization happening inside of the tech sector and it needs to accelerate. And then of course, the final piece is what brings us into the public sphere. And as frustrating as our polities are because they are not maximally inclusive, they're not even in some sense, they're not even sufficiently inclusive for people who live within the delimited territory of a nation state, right? Mm -hmm. But they are the, the vehicle that we have for refereeing these value trade-offs. And so where does the check ultimately on big tech's power come from? It comes from using the technology that we've built, not for optimizing, but for refereeing disagreements about values. And that's what our politics is. And, and there's no reason to think that, or, or I'd say where I come down is that I'm not yet at the point that I've lost total faith that democratic institutions can institute guardrails, that we ultimately need to move to a, to a place of government ownership or oversight of all these technologies. We, 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 do, we get extraordinary benefits it from the fact that this is, exists in the private sphere and in the market sphere. But in, we use the language of externalities in the book because as with any other social externality that's generated by private market behavior, that is the principal justification for government intervention in the market and for a set of regulatory guardrails. And the reality is that we have not had that for big tech. And so we haven't even experimented with what putting those guardrails in place might mean as a way of creating space for innovation while at the same time addressing these social harms. Can I add Rob, something to that as well, Nadula? Yeah. Uh, um, uh, I sign on, of course, uh, to what Jeremy just described, but I want to, in a certain respect, um, restate with even more emphasis in my own head, at least, your question um, in the terms of our book and where we began this conversation. Um, how do we get technologists or investors in technology to begin to think about the social uh, values, the values of democracy in their own activity? Um, our answer to that is challenging the optimization mindset itself because the logical extension of the optimization mindset when it leaves the realm of just thinking about a, a technical application, but becomes a life outlook, is that technologists become suspicious of democracy because democracy is not designed to optimize anything. It's designed to be a fair process of refereeing competing interests and values among citizens. So here's a simple formula for anyone listening. It's a well-known fact that the kind of political orientation of Silicon Valley founders is libertarian, um, techno-libertarian, sometimes people call it. Um, they're committed in some loose way to the minimal role of the government or the state. And when the techno-libertarian founders hire a, you know, um, 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 engineers within their own companies to develop their products, what you get is a recipe which in which you're optimizing for the libertarian mindset of the founders. You, you get libertarianism on steroids with respect to the technical product itself. And it's no surprise then, we shouldn't be surprised as ordinary citizens, that you hear enor enormous skepticism from Silicon Valley about the role of government. Because if you bring an optimization and libertarian mindset, you don't want that in the first place and democracy isn't optimizing. That's why at some level, not, not a, a single solution, but an important element, is to limit the application of an optimization orientation to a, a technical application where it can have extraordinary value. And to remind people that the value of democracy, the value of our collective enterprise of living together, not merely peaceably, but by trying to forge to a common good together, doesn't lend itself to an optimization mindset so obviously. And we tell a bunch of stories in the book that you know, for me at least bring this home, I was once invited to a, a small dinner, which involved a salon conversation amongst a lot of technologists and investors about what would it be like if we could find some place on earth that was devoted to the maximal progress of science and technology, a kind of interesting conversational topic. And conversation went around for a while and talked about, well, where would we do this? And what would the citizenship test be? And how would it work? And I raised my hand at one point and said, I'm just kind of curious, we haven't yet talked about 
the political arrangements here. Is this a democracy we're talking about building? And the immediate response for most people at the table was absolutely not. Democracy holds us back. It's too slow. This has to be a beneficent technocracy. At some deep level, at least among some people in Silicon Valley, I think that's their ultimate orientation to politics. And that's a problem for anyone who cares about democracy. Thank you so much. Um, we've gotten some questions from the audience and we don't have much time left. So I'm just gonna put um, one question to you, which is, um, it's kind of a legal question. Uh, it's more of a political question. I think, um, Jeremy, this is probably very much in your wheelhouse, but anybody should feel free to take a shot at it. Um, the question is, I noticed something not in the book. I, I noticed something that was not in the book, which is namely Citizens United. I apologize for bringing up something so US centric, apology accepted. Um, but is Citizen United, Citizens United a significant obstacle to some of the potential solutions that you are considering? So I know we have an international audience. And so so just to flag for folks, you know, this is really a, a question that's primarily about our campaign finance system and ultimately the role of private money uh, in, in, in our elections and the way in which private money might influence the possibilities and prospects for regulation. Um, but it also, think, sorry, yeah, sorry go to ahead. interrupt. Go Citizens on. United also redefined what counted as speech and yes. who was able to make speech. And so bringing a lot of uh, finance under the rubric, under the metric of, you know, protections, free speech protections. I think, I hope if I'm not extrapolating too much, I think that's probably what the person is alluding to as well is, how does this intersect with our idea of expanding the horizons of free speech and bringing in even more things into this protected category um, of, of speech? But go ahead, Jeremy. So, so I'll say something on this. Rob may want to jump in as well uh, on, on the speech questions. Um, you know, undoubtedly, one of the most challenging things to navigate in writing the book is, um, you know, the avowed American commitment to free speech and, and expanding notion of free speech, which makes the United States different in, in important ways from other democracies that have preserved or carved out a role for government in potentially limiting forms of speech that might bring about societal harm. Um, and you can think obviously about the European Union, Germany, Canada, a number of environments in which, in which speech restrictions are much more uh, not only tolerated but embraced than they are in the United States. Um, and, and this is really challenging terrain to navigate. Part of what is so important, uh, you know, in debates about, um, you know, Communications Decency Act, Section 230, and, and issues around content moderation is that actually in the United States, we reserve for companies the right and the authority to make choices about what speech they do and don't permit on their platforms. And so if those became public utilities, if those became public mechanisms, there'd actually be no grounds, right? No legal grounds for restricting some of the forms of speech that many of us are concerned about. The toxic hate speech that's amplified on the platforms or the lies about the 2020 election. And so one of the virtues of our current model um, is that there is a space that exists for choices to be made about limits on speech that wouldn't exist if these were entirely public entities. And so what we grapple with in, in part of the book is how then do you use that space to address social harms, knowing that the important actors in that space are often going to be private rather than public. So what are the way that public institutions can create incentives or oversight that, that lead to the effective an accountable use of that power that's reserved for the private sector. And so in some sense, that's an argument where if you hear people, you know, that's an argument, you know, to weigh against the notion of turning them into public utilities, but also just, you know, renders more nuanced the debates around CDA 230 and, and the importance of preserving an ability of platforms to make choices about speech that you can't really have in public spaces. I don't know, Rob, if you want to add something. Rob, to you wanted to jump yeah, in? Yeah, I, I want to take the point that uh, um, about uh, money being a form of speech and the worry that that might introduce. So Citizens United, um, you know, un, un, 
locked or unleashed a floodgate of new forms of money in American politics. The worry I'm assuming from, from David Rodney, the questioner, is that the, the kind of behavior that then Citizens United allows amongst the technology millionaires and billionaires and the very wealthy companies gives them a kind of freer reign now to spend their cash in order to get the political outcomes they want. Okay, so short kind of thought here, although I'm not a constitutional lawyer, so don't hold me to the constitutionality of what I'm going to say. I'm just gonna introduce this as a philosophical idea. We don't need number one to equate protecting freedom of expression with allowing money to be in the bundle of that. Um, allowing money into the bundle of freedom of expression gives greater voice to those with a fatter wallet, which is not in keeping with the basic idea of freedom of expression. Secondly, apropos the topic of the book, technology, the same is true for what it's worth with algorithmic amplification of your speech. A colleague of ours at Stanford named Renee DeResta has this fantastic line in which she says, freedom of speech is not the same as freedom of reach. No one is entitled as a matter of free speech to have their content amplified algorithmically to millions or billions of people around the world. Um, President Trump, deplatformed right now, still enjoys the constitutional protections of freedom of speech by being allowed to go out on the street corner and bark anything he wants, just like any other person can as well. There's no constitutional guarantee under the heading of freedom of speech, which says any company has to give you the same permission to algorithmically amplify your speech. Um, that's a misunderstanding of freedom of expression in the same way that bundling money into freedom of expression is a misunderstanding of it too. That is a fantastic point. And, um, you know, for me, um, one of the things that's always interesting about this freedom of expression, freedom of speech conversation is um, that it, there's a blurred distinction that happens, a bit of a sleight of hand that happens where people tend to blur the freedom of expression, being able to express yourself freely, and freedom, as you said, to reach, but also freedom from consequences. In a lot of countries, it's not so much that they curtail what you can say, it's that there are more things for which they are legal and their social consequences. So you brought up the example of Germany. You can still say, you know, pro-Nazi things in Germany, it's just that there will be consequences for it in a way that there won't be consequences for it, um, let's say in the United States. Um, and it was one of the things that really jumped out to me in the book as well, but also in this conversation about freedom of expression, because in a lot of countries, people are fighting for their freedom of expression, for the ability to say those things um, before they even get to the consequences, that they will not they're not able to express themselves, their political opinions in the public sphere as fully, like, you know, right now, Allah Abdul El Fattah is in jail, has been in pretrial detention for two years, in and out of jail since the Arab Spring for being one of the leading figures of the Arab Spring. That's different from, you know, freedom for not the, the consequences of that speech. So I think there's a bit of a sleight of hand that happens there. Um, we have five minutes to go. Um, I, I want to give you a chance. Um, you know, what haven't I asked you? Is there something that you wanted to say in this conversation that I haven't prompted you um, to say? Anything that you want the audience, you know, if there's one thing you get out of this book, this is what I want you to get from it um, before we end the conversation. Uh, I'll start with you, Mehran, because um, I, I left you. I, I wanted to follow through on that second, on that question, that last question that we had. <laughs> Well, so maybe it's not just the one thing I'd want to get people out of the get out of the book, but I also to fold in there another question on the QA, which had to do with, you know, why are we so worried about in some sense big tech's role in social degradation, or how do we measure it relative to other things that are going on, like cable news or whatever? And I think an important thing to take away is the notion of how we get the information we do in terms of what's pushed to us versus what we pull down for ourselves. And so I think for many years when we thought about interacting with things like cable news or other media sources, we made a choice about what information we wanted to get. We made a choice about there's particular magazines or particular newspapers or particular authors or whatever that I want to read. The choice we make now with social media is I use a particular platform and what that platform does is it pushes to me what it thinks I should read. And so that creates not only algorithmic amplification, but it creates a particular stream that I don't necessarily have control over. I get information pushed at me and that allows that information to be curated and potentially to be amplified or to be more polarized by the particular platforms themselves. 
So what we really need to understand in this high tech ecosystem are what are the algorithms and how are they being applied to us? So we can understand these things like information being pushed. How is that information being selected? Or when algorithms make decisions about our lives, like who gets access to credit, who gets interviewed for a job. Those are cases where most people don't even know that those algorithms are being applied. And so they have no due process to be able to challenge the results of those algorithms. And so what they need is that transparency. They need some understanding of how these significant things in their lives are being decided by machines. And ultimately those things need to be audited so we can understand how they're impacting different people in different ways and give people real agency to say, I wanna be able to challenge this because I'm not being treated equally to someone else. And that's something that's often overlooked right now because when these algorithms are applied, we just make the notion, we take the, they take it as fact that they're objective because it's computers making these decisions. And if there's one thing I would take, you know, want people to take away from this is that just because a computer is making a decision doesn't make it objective. All it does is give us a veneer that we're getting a better decision when in fact, all we're getting is an encoding of lots of history that has lots of bias in it. Um, Jeremy. So, uh, you know, this is a program and a, and a group at the Atlantic Council that cares about the intersection of tech and democracy. So I wanna leave you with a final thought on, on that connection. And just to say that um, there's a lot of reasons to be concerned about what democracy brings to the table in this day and age, both in the United States and around the world. We're at a moment of, of paralysis and polarization in the United States as well in, as, as in other countries. We're also at a moment of democratic recession. Um, you know, where progress that has been made over, over many generations is, is being scaled back, the threats to freedom of expression or freedom of association that you described. Um, and so for some people, when they hear us talk about the centrality of democracy, they're like, what are you guys talking about? Like either they have no faith in democracy or, or, or democracy just seems like such a, a, a sort of, you know, faces such an uphill climb. But I think one of the central arguments for us, um, you know, in the book is that the locus for the conversations about value trade-offs, which are so central to the society that we live in, um, have to be made outside of the purely private realm. Um, and that means they need to be made through our politics. And in many countries, democracy is the set of institutions that, that we've created to referee these value trade-offs. They're slow, they're imperfect, but ultimately they demand of us the exercising of our voice uh, and, and so that's why we come down feeling that this effort to renew democracy and to establish democracy's role is so important. Rob, 30 seconds. Don't fall for the tempting idea that the problem is good and bad people. If only we didn't have psychopaths like Mark Zuckerberg, for example, allegedly, then the problem would be better. Let's get good people to be in the founders or good companies rather than bad companies. That is an easy narrative that you could you could take on board and think the problem would go away, and it's wrong. The problem, as the title of our book suggests, is a system problem. It's a problem not of good or bad people or good and bad companies, but an insufficient orientation around various systems of governance that give incentives at the moment for social harms that we need to change. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, gentlemen. We are right on the hour. I'm gonna hand over to Rose. Thank you. And it wouldn't be a conversation about technology if some aspect of that technology didn't fail in the course of it. So I'm so glad I could fit that in at the end. But I just want to give a very sincere statement of gratitude to the authors for joining us today, to Ninjala for leading us in such an interesting and wide ranging conversation. My little nerd heart is very happy. Uh, and to all of you for joining us. Um, I am still going to make sure that the technology works here. I want to make sure that everyone knows that the event was recorded and will be uploaded to the Atlantic Council's website and YouTube channel. So if you'd like to rewatch that or share today's panel, we encourage you to do so. Uh, you can follow along with our work at the DFR Lab by following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, and all of the other various social platforms, and signing up for our newsletter, which is called The Source. And most importantly, don't forget to purchase your own copy of this exceptional book, System Error, Where Big Tech Went Wrong and How We Can Reboot from HarperCollins, your local bookstore, uh, or any of those online platforms. Thank you again for attending this event. We hope you enjoy your day and please keep following these wonderful scholars as they do the essential work. Thank you.